Uh, unite our hearts together in prayer and let's pray. Lord our God, we do indeed bless your holy name this morning. We give thanks for your gracious goodness to us. We give thanks that we can sing and that we can sing with hope because of Jesus our Savior. Because we come to you today as those who have trusted in the Lord and who know a great hope for the future. We give thanks for the light, the certainty, the eternal security, the hope that Jesus and the gospel of grace brings into a world that is so full of darkness, uncertainty, despair, and hopelessness. Lord God, we pray that more than anything else at this time of year, that we would delight in the Savior Christ, that we would rest in him, and that we would know the great hope that flows from a belief and a trust in Christ the Savior. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship. We thank you that we can come freely and without fear uh, unlike so many other Christians around the world, that we can do so without fear of persecution, without fear of uh, oppression or, or harm from out with. Lord God, we pray that we would uh, enjoy these great privileges which are ours and not take them for granted. We pray for those who are absent from our midst this morning, whatever they may be and whatever they may be engaged in, Lord God, that you would be with them. Pray for those who are uh, cast down with temporal uh, 
ailments and illnesses, that you would restore them in your time. We remember particularly those who are facing terminal and significant illness or treatment. Lord, that you would come alongside them and that you would be with them. We remember those who grieve and those who mourn, bereft of loved ones, that they would know the comfort and the hand of God in their lives. For those who have gone down a dark uh, hole, those who are following the broad road that leads to destruction, Lord God, we pray that they would be turned, that they would be turned to the narrow path that leads to eternal life. Uh, we know that few find it, and yet we pray that we would be faithful in pointing folk in the right direction, to the right way, uh, Jesus, who is the way and the truth and the life. Bless us now and go before us, forgiving us our sins, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now then, boys and girls, I've even got uh, Isabella on the machine today, so hopefully everything will run well. Um, let me ask Isabella to put a picture up and tell me if you know who these two dudes are. I think that's a recent photo. No, it's quite an old photo. Do you know who they are? No idea who these guys are. Okay, I'll tell you who they are. They are Orville and Wilbur Wright. You know who they are now? Well, some of the old people are nodding. Do you guys know? No. So you don't know what they're famous for? Oh, Hugh knows. What do you think? Um, the guys that exactly right. 1903, December 17th, to be exact, two young men, Wilbur and Orville uh, Wright, uh, were in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, and they did something really historic. They flew. They flew with a mechanical plane. They invented, they devised, they built a plane, and they flew it, which is quite amazing. But the first plane that they flew wasn't like your Airbus A380 or your Spitfire or your Vulcan or um, tornado or whatever you might think of as a plane. The planes that they flew initially, well, there's a picture of them on one of them. Uh, maybe you go to the next picture, Bella. How do you fancy crossing the Atlantic and that? Well, I don't even fancy crossing the Minch. I don't even fancy crossing Loch Broom and that, to be honest. But they were pretty daring, weren't they? Imagine taking off, off the ground in that contraption. Yeah, you'd have to have nerves of steel. Well, you know, when they'd flown for the first time, they were pretty excited. You can imagine, they've spent all this time investing their energies and their thoughts and their ingenuity into the design and the construction of a plane. And so they wanted to tell people when they'd managed it. They wanted to tell people, but it's back in the turn of the century. It's a long time ago. They couldn't just WhatsApp someone or type them an instant message but what they did was they used the ancient form of messaging, which is kind of like a text message or an instant message. It just wasn't instant. They sent a telegram. Ever heard of a telegram? Some of your parents, maybe some of your grandparents will know about telegrams. They're not that old. So they decided to wire a telegram. Here's a copy of it back to their father, who was a bishop, Bishop Milton Wright, who lived in Dayton, Ohio. So they were in North Carolina. So they went into the post office, the man typed up this telegram, and it was sent by post to their parents. Let me read. It's a simple message. Success. Four flights Thursday morning, all against 21-mile wind. Started from level with engine power alone. Average speed through air, 31 miles per hour. Longest, 57 seconds. Not really a long flight, isn't it? It's not quite transatlantic. Inform press. Tell the papers. Tell people about this home for Christmas. The father was so excited. He read the words and he said to the man, the clerk that had given him uh, the note, how amazing is this? Have you read, did you read it? Read this message, read this telegram. And he did. And he said, isn't it great? And do you know what the clerk said? Oh yeah, it's great. The boys will be home for Christmas. Kind of missed the point, didn't they? The big news was that they'd flown. The big news was that they devised a plane that had lifted off the ground, that had flown at, okay, 31 miles an hour for 57 seconds, but it was big news. But what the man picked up on was that the boys were going to be home for Christmas. But you know, that kind of happens every year at Christmas, doesn't it? We sometimes overlook the big news and we focus on the news that's not really all that important, all that grand. The world that we live in overlooks the big news that Jesus was born and that we celebrate at Christmas, Jesus. He is 
the reason for the season. Sometimes we miss the big news because we're focused on the small news. So we're focused on presents, and presents are good. Or we're focused on time with the family, and time with the family is great. And holidays are fun, and Christmas trees and lights are pretty. But the best news, in fact, the the news that the angel said was of great joy for all people, is that Jesus was born. And he was born as Savior of the world, the one who Matthew tells us would save people from their sins, Emmanuel, God with us. That's what his name means. So I hope this Christmas that you have a great time and that you get lots of nice presents and you eat lots of great food and that you have lots of laughs, playing games or watching programs. Pity Mr. Bean's not on anymore. Maybe look at the historic Mr. Bean's Christmas. It's a classic. But don't miss the big news of Christmas. The big news is that Jesus was born. The big news is that Jesus came and lived so that we might have an eternal Christmas, so that we may have eternal hope. And he did it all because he loves us. So that's the good news this Christmas. It's good news that we can fly in planes. It's even better news that when the time comes, we can go and be with Jesus for all of time. Well, we're going to sing. We're going to sing uh, another carol today. O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. And then after we've sung that, we'll remain standing and we'll say the Lord's Prayer together, the words that come up on the screen. So let's stand and sing, O come, all ye faithful. This morning from Matthew's Gospel and Matthew chapter 2. Same passage as we read last week and it's just a few verses so just to refresh our memory we're going to read uh, these verses together again. This then is the Word of God. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, 
in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And, having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Amen. May the Lord bless that reading of his word to us. Well, folks, shall we pray again? Let's unite our hearts together. Our God and Father, we thank you for uh, the peace that we now have to be still and to know that you are God, to wait upon you as we open your word and to revel in its clarity and its instruction, knowing that as we open your word afresh each day, it uh, draws us deeper in and gives us more insight, more understanding, more knowledge, more application of the faith that we have in Jesus and how that transforms our lives, not only in the present, but for all of time. Uh, Lord, we pray that today as we open your word in, familiar, uh, in a familiar passage and around familiar themes, that you would give us a renewed insight, a, a new understanding, a deepening appreciation for the wonder of the Christmas story, for the wonder of a God who loves his people so much that he would send his one and only Son into the world, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, we give thanks that we are made in your image and in your likeness, created uh, with you in mind and the glory of your name. We pray that we would raise uh, our voices and our hearts to you in praise and in worship, lifting our eyes and fixing them on Jesus, that we may glorify God the Father, just as he did through his life, through his ministry, through his witness, and through his sacrifice of self for the good of others. Lord God, we know that everything in life hinges upon Christ. Even the, the, the calendar that we follow, follow is based upon the reality of the life of Jesus Christ. Uh, so, Lord, we know that he lived. We know that there is historical evidence, that there is veracity to these claims. But we pray that each one here today would work out for themselves who Jesus truly was. Not only that he lived, not only that he was real, for we know that to be true, but that he was also whom he claimed to be, the saviour of the world the one who came to seek and to save that which was lost, the one who came to serve and not to be served, the one who came to give his life as a ransom for many, the one who had no sin that was to be made sin, that we might be called the righteousness of God. And so, Lord, we pray today as we delight in the gospel and in its truth and in its power that you would be with us in all of our frailty and in all of our weakness. We look around and we see so many different situations, even within this building this morning, uh, the Church of Christ beset by uh, temporal challenges uh, and uh, illnesses and difficulties, um, obstacles and hindrances. Lord God, would you be with each and every person? For every family represented here, we know that there are uh, trials and tribulations, that there are difficulties and there are sadnesses of heart. Uh, but we give thanks that you are gracious, that you are good, that you are God, and that there is nothing that is beyond uh, your ability or beyond the possibility of uh, your uh, power. And so, Lord, we pray expectantly asking that you would uh, heal rifts, that you would bring back the wandering sheep, that you would save the lost sinner, uh, that you would uh, cast from us any feelings of pride or haughtiness, that we would be embodied as, your Lord, as the Lord's people, as those who are embodied by meekness and humility that we would be those who seek to raise uh, your name and glorify you in all that we say and in all that we do. Forgive us for the way that we overlook the main things so often, being preoccupied with side issues, preoccupied with temporal things, preoccupied with things that distract us from the, the majesty and the glory of God in Christ Jesus. And so, Lord, we pray uh, that you would be with us. We pray that you would give faith to those who have none, 
We pray that you would open the eyes of those who are blind. We pray that you would unstop the ears of those who are deaf. We pray that you would replace hearts of stone with hearts of flesh and that you would do that, not through uh, man, but through the power of your spirit and by the power of your word. And we pray now that as we open your word and as we look at uh, its truth, that you would give us insight, that we wouldn't hear the mere words of man, but that you would speak into our hearts. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we turn back to uh, Matthew 2 for a wee while this morning, let's again sing from Psalm 8 in the Sing Psalms, and we'll sing the whole psalm. To God's praise, we'll stand and sing together. In all the earth, O Lord, our Lord, how glorious is your Turn back then with me uh, to Matthew 2 and the gifts of Christmas. And today we're looking at frankincense. There are many triggers in life for nostalgia, isn't there? For memory, there can be a certain view that when it comes into sight, elicits or evokes a, a, an emotive reaction from, you know, you know, coming over the top of Dromossi Bray and seeing the beauty of Inverness. Uh, spread forth below you, or maybe, you know, coming down in Verlal and seeing Loch Broom. Not quite as spectacular, but you get it. There might be a specific flavor that you enjoy, and as soon as you eat it, it takes you to a place in your memory uh, where you ate that thing or where you were first introduced to it. Music, a really strong trigger about memory. You can place yourself in many different places in the world. Well, at least uh, I can. I'm sure it's not just me. 
You can place yourself by listening to a specific music. The, the big wheel album uh, from Runrig, driving in my father's M Reg Green Cavalier, heading for Uist. It's just a, a memory that's there as soon as you hear Flower of the West. However, smell, smell is one of the, the strongest memory triggers. The smell of red diesel that takes you right into your grandfather's uh, tractor. Or the smell of old Jimmy's Benson and Hedges cigarettes as you sit in his JCB with him as they're building Rollerball in Inverness. Or the smell of TCP as your hands plunged into Andrew Forbes's uh, bathroom sink because you've torn your hand open. Uh, these smells are just things that are with you always. I'm sure we've all got our own particular smells. Smells evoke memories. The smell of cinnamon might take you to Christmas time. Perfume, a certain scent may remind you of a certain person. Cut grass of summer days or chlorine, the swimming pool or just the kitchen tap in uh, Ella Pool. We all have what is called the olfactory nerves, uh, which are connected to something called the limbic system, which controls our emotions and even our motivations. So our smell is linked even in that. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. If you've watched Surgeons on the Edge of Life recently, you'll know that as they deal with the intricacy and the, the complexity of the human body. Well, we've got these nerves uh, and they are connected to our brains and they wire us in a way that they connect our smells, uh, connect us to the life around about us. Some people like a certain smell so much that they will go and buy uh, an incense stick that is that smell or a candle or the new fad is the scentsy burners where you uh, have a pan and you drop a lump of scented wax into it and it melts and it uh, permeates your home. You can get just about any smell, although I haven't found Benson and Hedges or Red Diesel yet. But we do that because we appreciate smells. They are evocative. They raise uh, emotions and memories in our minds. And as soon as you light up a candle or a scentsy burner or an incense stick with that particular scent, your mind goes somewhere. Smell is such a strong trigger. So here's the question we have this morning. Why give frankincense to a toddler? Why give frankincense to a toddler? Give him a toy tractor? Yeah. Give him a chase from Paw Patrol? We understand that. But incense? What child is really going to be happy with incense? What is the meaning of that? Well, we're going to seek to answer that question today as we look at frankincense as we take some time to break down uh, these three gifts that are given to Jesus. I think that as familiar as Matthew 2 may be and as familiar as the Christmas story might be to us that so often familiarity breeds contempt but not even that we're so familiar that we glaze over it. We, we gloss over the, the finer detail of what's presented before us. Like the Wright Brothers telegram that we spoke to the kids about, we kind of bypass the big stuff and maybe focus on the less significant uh, stuff that's there. Now, um, we looked last week at the Magi. We, we had an introduction to them and how uh, they appear after the birth of Jesus, not at the birth of Jesus that's so often uh, promoted, but sometime after when Jesus is a child, when they are in a house. You see that in verse 1. Bell, I'll put verse 1 up for us. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, behold, some wise men of the east came uh, to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews. Some scholars think that they turned up as much as two years after Jesus was born. We're not sure, but it was time enough after uh, the birth event that he was a young uh, child and no longer in the manger, but in a house. So three things today as we continue these thoughts about the gifts that these men bring. The men who gave the gift, the meaning of this particular gift, and the ministry of the one who got the gift. Of all the things that we have uh, in the story here, uh, there are certain things that we don't have. 
For instance, Matthew left out any explanation about the Magi. He just said that wise men came from the East. That was the sum total of what he said. We have to go back into history and historians to find out more about them. We did a bit of that last week, and we'll do a wee bit more in a moment. Interestingly, Matthew didn't say anything about the star either. He just said that they followed a star, and the star showed them where to go. Many people want to make a big deal out of that star. Matthew, he didn't make anything of that. But what he did want to show us, and what he did record, and what he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write down, were the gifts that these wise men brought to Jesus. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So we have that information preserved for us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and by Matthew as he records it in his gospel. Not only were these gifts expensive, not only were they precious, but they were symbolic, symbolic of other things. Now, immediately, when you think about last week, we thought about Jesus the king and the gift of gold for a king. And today we come to frankincense, and that's intrinsically linked to the priesthood. And immediately in your mind, surely you're going, Jesus Christ, prophet, priest, and king. So these are offices that Jesus held, prophet, priest, and king. We've already looked at king. We might be looking at things backwards as we look at these three gifts, but bear uh, with us. James Montgomery Boyce, the uh, commentator, said, linguistically, because these gifts appear at the end of the story after the child has been found, they occupy in the text a place of prominence. They occupy a place of prominence, and therefore it's good for us to consider them. Let's go to verse 9. Next slide. Uh, When they heard the king, after they had heard the king, they went on their way And the star that they had seen when it rose ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented to him, uh, presented uh, him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So they recognized that Jesus was king, and they gave him gifts according to that, the gold that we considered last week. And last week we asked, is he your king? Is he king of your life? Have you come today again to worship the king? Or are you a pretender like Herod was? Or are you disinterested like the religious were at the time who knew the prophecies, but who didn't even bother to come and investigate this child that had been born? So is he your king? But today we have frankincense. And let me give an overarching uh, summary of what we have here. We have a group of priests, Gentile priests, from afar, bringing a substance that priests used in the Jewish temple system to somebody who would fulfill the role of priest in the future. Okay, so that's an overarching picture of what we have in this gift. Let's look at these three things then. Point one, up on your screen, the men who gave the gift the men who gave the gift. We did a bit of this last week, but there's so much, actually, once you go digging, and once you go and study the magi, the wise men. Um, The word magi is really untranslatable. I don't even know what untranslatable is a word, but it can't be translated very easily, so we're given the term wise men. Um, They were called magi. The magi were a tribe of people, and what's interesting, we noted last time the historian Herodotus said that they were a priestly caste of Medes, uh, that is, they came from the ancient Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, But the magi were a small group within a large group, the large group being the Medes, and this being the priestly tribe of the Medes. It was very similar to the nation Israel, the people of God, where you had 12 tribes, but one tribe was set apart from the others as the priestly tribe, the Levites. Um, They represented the whole of the nation, as it were, to God as a priestly tribe. They were representatives of the people before God. Well, it would seem that the, the Medes had a very similar set up. There were many tribes within the Median kingdom, but they selected one tribe uh, to perform ritual and ceremony and all of the sacrificial functions of worship that they engaged in. And the tribe that they chose was the tribe of the Magi. Uh, And 
they maintained an influence, the Magi, uh, down through many, many generations, through several, em- several empires throughout history. They were important to the Babylonian Empire. They were important to the Medo-Persian Empire. They were important to the Greek, Greek Empire. They were uh, important to the Empire of Rome, as was the case here. Kings would seek out the Magi to get advice from them, to, to seek guidance, spiritual uh, adv- advice from them. So here we have this hereditary priesthood, much like the Levites, who influenced the kings of the day. They worshipped one god. Remember the Zoroastrianism? Uh, Zoroastrians, the, the primary element of worship was fire. We don't know exactly what that was, except they must have seen fire as having been symbolic of the power of God. They had an altar. On that altar was the flame that was burning perpetually. It was never out. Uh, and they believed that that flame was lit by God himself. And so they had an altar where the fire burned, and then they had another altar where they sacrificed animals. So similar to the Levitical uh, form of worship in the Old Testament, I'm sure you all know about that. And when they consumed an animal on the altar of sacrifice, they lit that fire off the altar that was burning with the perpetual flame. Now, bear with me here. I know you might be thinking, wow, this is a lot of information, but it is helpful and it will become clear uh, as we go on. Once the sacrifice for them was consumed, again, much like the, the Levites and the people of Israel in ancient times, the animal, the sacrifice was then eaten. It was consumed both by the worshiper and by the Magi uh, priests. Not only that, the Magi had a system of clean versus unclean animals, kosher versus unkosher, so to speak. Certain insects, certain uh, reptiles they avoided completely, much like the Jews did. Not only that, when it came to the dead, they were fastidious about how they would handle uh, dead people because they believed that you could be defiled by uh, touching a, a corpse. So you're saying, well, why is all of that important? Why is all of that significant to us as we think about frankincense? Well, it's important because when Daniel comes into Babylon, where there are magi in the court of Nebuchadnezzar, he becomes the head of them and the chief over the magi. Daniel 5, the verse is up on the screen. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time your father was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods, your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners, or diviners depending on how you want to say it. So when Daniel becomes the head of the Magi, he brings to them this Jewish belief system that he's grown up with. He brings with him all of the prophecies of the Messiah Christ. Uh, He begins to tell them, they begin to learn about the the scriptures of uh, God, uh, the Torah, the, uh, the word of God. So here we have, with the Magi, we have this priesthood that has a political power that's involved in royal courts uh, that is significant to ancient government, if you will. We could do with a few wise men in our government yet today. Um, The reason that they were called wise men is because they were sought out for their wisdom. They were sought out to be consulted about the future. They were seen as having Uh, power. So kings would have them in their courts. Kings would want to know, how should I move my armies? Uh, What country should I invade? What did my dream mean? And the Magi would consult, as it were. They'd be consultants to uh, kings and royalty for these reasons. And and what's fascinating is that uh, no Persian could become king until two things had happened. Number one, they had to master the, the spiritual disciplines of the Magi, And two, they had to be approved and crowned by the Magi. How's that for power? So they were literally king makers. They weren't just king advisors. They would make kings and they consulted and had influence down through many kingdoms. In fact, the Old Testament, Esther 1, Daniel 6, uh, uses the phrase, the law of the Medes and Persians. Well, that's to do with the Magi. So to sum it up, they're a priestly tribe. They're, influence, they're influential 
over many kingdoms, over many hundreds and hundreds of years. They came to prominence during the Babylonian era under King Nebuchadnezzar, and they've been influenced by the prophet Daniel, who brought to them the Jewish scriptures, making predictions about the Messiah, Jesus, the child who has been born. So, these are the men who gave the gift. Secondly, we need to consider the meaning of this particular gift. And when they opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What is frankincense, you might be saying? We're going to get to the point today. What is frankincense? Well, frankincense was a very particular resin from a very particular tree, a very kind of, a particular kind of pure um, uh, liquid, highly prized, highly sought after, very expensive. It came from a tree on the Arabian Peninsula. The scientific name for the tree, if you want to know, is Boswellia serrata or Thurifera. I know you probably always wanted to, to know that, but the tree's native to Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Oman, Yemen, and it only came to Israel by import. It came by caravan. Uh, you know, it had to be imported from afar. It wasn't an indigenous plant. So an incision's made in the trunk of the Boswellia sereta or Boswellia thurifera in the winter months of the year, and out comes this sap, this yellowy amber, whitish kind of sap. And they would allow it to dry and allow it to harden and to crystallize, and then they would grind it up into a powder. And then when it was burnt, it would give off this beautiful, pungent, woody, uh, kind of uh, smell with a, a hint of uh, oily sort of fragrance to it. It was highly, highly sought after. That's frankincense. And incense was always offered to God. Uh, it was a fragrance in, in a sense that, in essence, rose to God, that God might be pleased with its smell. In the Old Testament, it was stored in the front of the temple in a special uh, chamber. Uh, it was sprinkled so that it would give off this sweet aroma. In fact, in Exodus 30, uh, it'll come up in your screens. It says that incense is for God, not for people. Uh, then the Lord said to Moses, take fragrant spices, gum, resin, onicha, uh, galbanum, and pure frankincense, all in equal amounts, and make a fragrant blend of incense, the work of a perfumer. It is to be salted and pure and sacred, set apart for God. Grind some of it to a powder and place it in the front of the Ark of the Covenant Law in the tent of meeting, where I will meet with you all. It shall be most holy to you. Do not make any incense with this formula for yourselves. Consider it holy to the Lord. So frankincense is important to those who read Scripture because it appears in the Bible 17 times. It's not just at the birth of Jesus. It appears in different places and at different times, but it's always associated with one thing, the priesthood of Israel. It was used, it was a substance that was used for a priest, and it was a substance that was used by priests. It was used for priests when they were anointed, when they were ordained into the priesthood. They took oil, mixed it with frankincense, so they made this wonderful smell, and then it was the, the person being ordained was anointed with that to mark them out, to set them apart from, for service to God, that they would become a representative of the people before God. Not only was it used for priests, but it was used by priests. It was then used by priests in a very particular offering called the meal offering. Now, you all are aware of the Levitical uh, sacrificial system, and I'm sure you've read up on it this morning before you came. Uh, just in case you didn't, let's just refresh your memory with Leviticus chapter 2 and verse 2. Uh, it'll come up on the screen. Uh, the priest shall take a handful of the flour and oil together with all the incense and burn it as a memorial portion on the altar, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. As if God can smell it, their devotion, uh, their sacrifice to him, their obedient faithfulness in doing what has, he has called them to do. Um, I think what Paul had in mind perhaps is this when he said in Philippians chapter 4, it'll come up on the screen, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God, talking about the financial giving and support that the Philippians offered to Paul's ministry. Is it what David referred to in Psalm 141, 
when he said, I call you, Lord, come quickly to me, hear me when I call you. My prayer shall be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. So as a substance, frankincense was a sweet-smelling substance that was used by the Jewish priests uh, in the worship of God uh, for Israel in the Old Testament. So we have a substance that is used for priests and by priests, and it is given to one who would become a priest. And that's our third point, the ministry of the one who got the gift. Mary and Joseph might have been thinking, what is this? First gold? I mean, wow. But frankincense? I mean, frankincense is for the priests. It's for the temple. Why are they giving frankincense to our child? Well, it's symbolic. It's prophetic, isn't it? Because one of the roles that Jesus would fulfill or take up would be the role of priest. And not just any old priest, but the great high priest. He would be above all. We know that in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, it's one of the great themes of the, the writer to the Hebrews. Eleven times in that book, Jesus is called our great high priest. In other words, what he means is that right here and right now, for those whose trust is in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we have a representative before God the Father in heaven. He is fulfilling the work of of the priest. You today, Christian, have a great high priest in Jesus, the one who is seated at the right hand of God the Father in the throne room of heaven, the one who makes representation for you, as John says, who is your advocate, who lives to intercede for you. That's good news this Christmas. That's the big news of Christmas, not the tinsel and the wrapping paper, not anything else, but our great high priest. It's the theme of the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13. You know it. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Next one. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. The writer of the Hebrews goes on at great lengths to say that Jesus Christ's priesthood is much better than the Old Testament priesthood of Aaron. It's better because, well, he quotes Psalm 110, doesn't he? The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek forever. So we have this substance, this frankincense, used by a Jewish priest, given by uh, Persian Gentile priests to somebody who would become what the Bible calls our great high priest, Jesus. That's good news. Now here's something that Jesus said, after he died, after he rose, after he ascended into heaven. It says that as a great high priest, he ascended into heaven, and then he did something that a lot of us just kind of pass over as we read it. Do you remember the scripture, Hebrews 10, 12? But when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. What is the significant portion of that verse? He sat down. What does that mean? Why is that important? It's important because the priests in the Old Testament never sat down. If there was one item of furniture absent from the temple, it was a chair. If there was one piece of furniture that was not in the tabernacle, it was a chair. They were on their feet all of the time, symbolic of the fact that the work was never done. The work of the priest was never done. They had to sacrifice and repeat those sacrifices every day, every, one, every week, every month, every year, every decade. It was never done. 
And then here comes Jesus, the great high priest, who acts as a priest, making an offering in the sacrifice of himself, a sacrificial lamb slaughtered, offering himself for the sin of the world. And he dies and he conquers death and he's raised to life and he ascends into heaven and he has, uh, goes through his coronation as king. And then he sits down, which means only one thing. It corresponds to his words on the cross, doesn't it? It is finished. It's over. It's done. It's fulfilled. What Jesus has done on the cross is enough to deal with the sin of mankind to that point and right up until the culmination of all time when he will return and take to himself those who are his. He sat down. We think, we read over that. We don't even think about it. It's significant because he sat down as one who had finished the task, who had fulfilled the role. And by the way, to sit at the right hand of a monarch was the most significant place to sit. It's a place where the Magi sat, those close advisors to the king. The closest priest or advisor representative sat at the right hand of the king. And so Jesus goes into the throne room of heaven to the King of kings and to the Lord of lords and he sits down at the right hand of God as saviour of the world with a task finished as our great high priest, the one who ever lives to intercede for his people. Is that not good news this Christmas, this morning? The work of salvation complete in Christ fulfilled his mission and offers you a place in his eternal kingdom. How? Why? Because he loves you and through faith in him. It is by grace you have been saved. It's not about what we do. It's not about how much we amass. It's not about how religious we are. But it's about our trust in Christ. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Have you ever had that experience in life when someone says, oh, I'm praying, we're praying for you. And you think, fantastic thank you. It's quite, it's quite um, self-affirming in that sense. It's, it's, it's encouraging to us to know that people are praying for us in the situation that we are in. Well, Jesus is praying for his children. How's that? Interceding, talking to God the Father from the right hand, seated with him in the throne room of heaven representing us before God the Father, our advocate, our heavenly representative, occupying the most privileged, prized place. Jesus, the Savior, Jesus born in Bethlehem, our great high priest. He prays for us. Happy Christmas. Hallelujah. Christmas. Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. He fulfills the role of priest. He makes intercession for us. He represents us. He is our high priest forevermore. This is exactly what Job asked for uh, in the Old Testament. If you know your Old Testament, you know Job. He's feeling alienated from God, so isolated from God because of his physical suffering. Some of us have been there. We feel cut off. We feel weighed down. We feel burdened. We feel that in the middle of the suffering, God's nowhere to be seen. And Job cries out for a, for a mediator, for an arbiter, for a go-between, as it were, between himself and God. If only there was someone that could mediate between us, someone to bring us together, he cried out. And then we come to the New Testament, and we're introduced to Jesus. He is that mediator. He is that arbiter. He is that go-between. As Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 2, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Jesus is the middleman, you might say. The world that we live in doesn't look at the middleman favorably. We'll talk about cutting out the middleman, get rid of the middleman, go straight to the source. We can't do that in salvation. We need the middleman, as it were. We need Christ the man, the one who stood in the middle, the one who bridged the gap, the one who took upon himself the sin of the world, that we might have access 
to God the Father, and so that he might represent us before God the Father in heaven. That's the gospel, that Jesus stands in our stead, bears our sin, that we might be reconciled to God the Father. There's a great example of this in Scripture, isn't there? In Paul, you know, the the letter to Philemon, uh, you've probably seen it. Uh, Philemon had fled, probably stolen some stuff from his, from his owner, had come, had met Paul, had been converted, had become a Christian, and now this criminal ex-slave is a brother in Christ to Philemon and to, to Paul. And so Paul writes to Philemon, and he says, for there is, uh, if he has done any, you, any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, I'm writing this by my own hand. I will pay it back. See what Paul's doing there? Paul is being a middleman between Onesimus and his slave owner. He is bridging the gap, as it were. He's taking the debt to himself. It is an example of what Jesus has done for us. We need encouragement in this life don't we? We need encouragement in our faith. Joyce Landorf Heatherly wrote a book called Balcony People. Balcony people, she says, are those who cheer you on. They're in your balcony, as it were. They're the ones who will encourage you and say to you, you can do it. They will encourage you all the time. But then she says there are also those who are basement people. There are those who are your critics, those who will always see the negative, those who have always got a lump under their seat, those who are always complaining about something. They're the basement people. So there's balcony people and there's basement people. Paul was a balcony person. Jesus is the ultimate balcony person, if you will. He died, he ascended, he rose, he is in the balcony of heaven, as it were. He is the great high priest forevermore, the perfect advocate for us. The gap is too wide for us to cross. The water is wide, I can't cross over. And neither have I wings to fly, as the song says. But Jesus has bridged the gap. He is the king who is born and given frankincense because he will be the great high priest. Do you know that the word priest in Latin is the word pontifex? And one of the meanings of pontifex is bridge builder. Jesus, the great high priest, our great, my great high priest is a bridge builder, and he has bridged the gap between my sin and rebellion and the holiness of God, and he'll do it for you as well. Let me close with a story, a new story from the January the 21st, 1930. Let me just read it. His arms twitching with shocks from electric current Harold Vivian, a young radio engineer, literally spliced with his body a broken link in the vast hookup and made it possible to listeners listeners in 59 North America radio stations to hear King George's speech today. Just a few minutes before the King began his address, which opened the Naval Conference in London, somebody in the control room of the Columbia Broadcasting Company tripped over the wires to the generator which energized the entire network. Vivian, chief control operator, grasped the wires together with his hands to restore the circuit. Leakage of the current threw his body to the floor, shook his arms with spasms, but he held on without a break for 20 minutes until new wires could be connected. And as the king approached the microphone in London and spoke to the United States, his, his words were literally being transmitted through the body of that man. It's a powerful image, isn't it? Powerful illustration. That's what Jesus did for all of mankind. Heaven's voice is transmitted through the person of the Lord Jesus. He is the image, Paul says, of the invisible God. He reveals God's intent. He reveals God's word. He reveals God's will, and he fulfills them. Coming that we may, coming to live as we live, coming to die for us, that he may represent us in the throne room. He is the king. He is the king of kings. 
He is worthy of our gold. He is the great high priest. But is he yours? Let's pray. Father God, we give thanks for this wonder that Jesus is our King, that he is our great high priest, that he is worthy of our praise, and that he intercedes for us. Lord, may we delight in him. May we trust in him. May we follow him in faith. We ask in Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing uh, from the hymn, In Christ Alone My Hope Is Found. Let's stand and sing together. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, found through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe. This gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, hid in the death of Christ I lay. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, love of God, and fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with us all now and evermore. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.